During the 19th century, the horn transitioned from the natural to the valve horn. Despite an initial fascination with the new innovation of the valves, the French school strove to maintain the early instrument throughout the century, with many believing this instrument to be the superior, more artistic form. Today, this move has often been interpreted as a reflection on French conservatism or due to the calibre of the natural horn players graduating from the Paris Conservatoire. The revival of interest in the natural horn that occurred with the historically informed performance movement has based much of its study on the pedagogical sources behind this training. When I came to study this instrument in the late 1990s in London, two of the most important, two of the most important rules of natural horn playing were given to be... Ooh. One second, get this working. Excellent. Two of the most important rules were given to be, firstly, that one should aim to blend the open and stop notes of the instrument so that the differences between them could barely be perceived, and two, that one should avoid at all costs any smearing of the pitch between the open and stop notes, or vice versa. The concern about this risk extended to some espousing the view that the natural horn could not play true legato and instead had to use a form of legato tonguing similar to that used by the slide trombone. These two key tenets of contemporary natural horn playing are, I believe, inaccurate descriptions of the French school during the 19th century. Whilst many promoters of this approach have incorporated valid information from the sources of these times, these rules are clearly based towards a late 20th century concept of the true horn sound. It is my belief that in order to get a truer picture of the style of horn playing circa 1820 to 1860s, we should be actually reversing these rules. Instead of blending the open and stop notes on the instrument, we should actively use the different timbres afforded us, and that portamento, an, an effect inherent in, but not restricted to, going from stop to open notes and vice versa, should be introduced into our playing of the instrument. In doing so, we harness two key express devices, tambour variety and portamento, that were common practice for singers and many other instrumentalists during this era. I'd like to add two other things I'm um, currently playing with, but I'm not going to discuss today. Two other rules that were very common. Firstly, that instrumentalists should emulate singers, and secondly, that instrumentalists should aim to emulate the long vocal line of singers. And again, these are things that I'm beginning to think we should be turning on their head, that singers should em emulate us instrumentalists, and a more spoken style of delivery should be emulated, but that's not for today. The natural horn has no keys and the means of creating notes via breath, oscillation of the lips and manipulation of the hand hidden in the bell of the instrument are challenging to describe. Therefore, the instrument suffers from the problems faced by singers, an issue identified, identified by Clive Brown in his 2009 chapter, Singing and String Playing in Comparison. Brown comments that, quote, instructions for singers or counts of their performances are essentially subjective since the mechanism of the voice cannot be seen or described in the way that a violinist techniques can be seen and described. As Roger Freitas has written, communication of vocal style is always forced to rely on verbal imagery, imagery that often suggests different things to different people. In order to argue not only that we should be incorporating timbre shifts and portamento into the natural horn playing, but in also in order to propose a means of doing so, I concur with Brown that it is necessary to look at more tangible treaties of other instruments in order to understand both the mechanics and the aesthetics of these expressive devices. Nevertheless, Given the strong links and contemporary comparisons that were made between one particular exponent of timbre shifts on the horn, Jacques-Francois Gallet, and the singers of the period, I have found turning first to the vocal practitioners beneficial, especially concerning the duality of timbres as well as the concept of portamento as a way to navigate between two categories of timbres. Um, I'm very grateful to this letter. Daniel Lenhard, who is a local horn player and scholar of the instrument, has just passed on to me this letter from Rubini, a leading tenor of the time. And this is very typical of a lot of the language used discussing Galley about very often he's seen as another voice just using the horn. 
And these people here, we've got Galay, third, uh, second from the left. Um, these are a lot of the people that I've been looking at. Um, Dupres, Garcia, and Galay were all contemporaries teaching at the Paris Conservatoire at the same time. Dupres and Garcia being very much exponents of the bel canto Italian school of singing. And Rubini is a tenor who Galay works with a lot, the author of the letter I just showed. The na this is very, very familiar to all of you. The, the natural horn forms its notes by manipulation of the right hand and the bell of the instrument. The instrument has recourse to the 16 or more open notes of the harmonic series. The chromatic notes in between are created by the partial or full closure of the bell to form notes that are referred to as stopped. The open notes are characteristically clearer and timbre, whilst the stop notes can range from the indistinct and covered to brassy and shrill, while some new notes are barely distinguishable from open notes. And at this juncture, I just want to show you part of Garcia's um, art of singing, um, in which he's these are two of the terms that he uses to describe the timbre um, that singers should be exploring, the timbre clair and the timbre sombre. So we've got singers at the time actively discussing using variations of timbre. It is important to recognize that on the horn, with the exception of, I would argue, five notes, the low F sharp and A flat below the stave, the B flat, F sharp and A, which we often take our hand out of the bell for, notes can normally be either open or stopped. When we're looking to emulate or map expressive devices proposed by practitioners of other instruments, this can be an issue. For example, Garcia states that for singers, any note can be either the open or the closed timbre. Whilst open and closed timbres are available to the natural horn, most notes do not have the option for both timbres. Further to this, the differing approaches of the Austro-Germanic and French schools are important. The Austro-Germanic school of horn playing normally only gives the B-flat and F-sharps as open notes. Um, you can see them down, uh, sorry, above, there we go. Um, so with the French school, we, off we see that they have a difference between these notes, which is possible to play both open and stopped. We see them being used as enharmonics. Now, this is a key point when looking at the French repertoire for evidence of composers or performers choosing to harness a particular timbre color, a subject I will return to later. Now, just turning to the expressive device of portamento, on the natural horn, we have the option to play from open to open notes. Um, so these are the ones I've marked in red. Stopped to stopped notes. These are the ones I've marked in yellow. Open to stopped. These are the ones marked in green. And finally, stop to open, um, the one I've marked up in blue. The status of the notes that start and end the portamento plus the placement of the interval within the harmonic series will determine the character of the portamento. However, on this element, I have yet to find any discussion of the te this technicality in the sources. Timbral shifts inherent in the natural horn have been frequently condemned by modern day critics. This review of Andrew Clark's debut EMICD, Andrew was my teacher, um, is a good case in point. The reviewer, Christopher Mowat, raises questions which many HIP researchers would have heard ad infinitum. Surely these instruments and techniques were not sufficient at the time. How happy everyone must have been when modern instruments came along, etc., etc., ad nauseum. Putting aside Moet's belief that performers, composers, audiences wanted something better, and focusing instead on his description of the, quote, strange, incongruous metallic notes of an instrument that was crying out. Remember this phrase, an instrument that was crying out. This description is not vastly different to the earliest accounts of hand technique in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it is these early descriptions that give us a tantalizing glimpse of the use of timbre and portamento on the horn. These dates outline, uh, outlined here are rough dates which I consider these practitioners to be more relevant. Hand technique, an innovation associated with early 18th century school of horn playing in Dresden, was not a staple 
of most horn players' technique until the late 18th century. Prior to the 19th century, it is a technique broadly associated with the solo and chamber repertoire rather than tutti orchestral horn playing. From the mid-1760s onwards, a number of solo horn players visited Paris displaying this new technique to great acclaim. You'll probably recognize this image. Strasbourg-born Jean-Joseph Rudolph was the first of these musicians to arrive in Paris, entering the service of the Prince de Conti around 1765. And it is from around this period that Rudolph is depicted in this group portrait. His return to France and his appearances at the Concert Spirituel are often cited as the first introduction of hand technique to Paris. Audiences were, quote, surprised and delighted end quote, by Rudolph's concerti, music that had previously, quote, not been thought possible to render on this instrument, which he performed with a rare perfection on an otherwise clumsy instrument. Schubert writes that Rudolph's affectionate passages always succeeded splendidly, going on to state that Rudolph was one of the first who expressed the mezzo tint with the horn. Schubert defines the mezzo tint as the ability to blend notes into one another so as to disguise the degrees of the scale. To me, suggesting a type of portamento, therefore potentially identifying this effect as a core component of hand technique from its earliest use in France. In the case of um, the most famous of these visiting horn players, Giovanni Punto, Critics of the time highlighted similar co concerns to Moat regarding the timbre changes created by this technique, as well as giving crucial information as to its novelty. For example, Mr. Punto and many others famous on this instrument constantly uses this method by which means the half tones are expressed, which is not to be done by any other method, but is deemed by judges of the horn that the principal beauty of the tone is greatly impaired by. And Charles Burney, it must, however, be discovered by every discriminating hearer that the factitious half notes that are made by the hand in the mouth of the instrument are sounds of a different quality from the natural tones of the instrument. We have often thought that Ponto, with all his dexterity, produced some of these new notes with a similar difficulty to a person ridden by a nightmare who tries to cry out but cannot. As I say, I'm struck by the similarity of Moet and Burney's language. These Accounts acknowledge that hand technique, as demonstrated by Punto in the second half of the 18th century, incurred terrible changes. Whilst Rodolphe was considered a leading horn player in France in the second half of the 18th century, his pedagogical importance came as a notable teacher of solfege. Punto, based in France for the last quarter of the century, appears to have had aspirations to teach at the early conservatoire, but was overlooked in, raft, in favor of a raft of horn teachers, including one of his former pupils, Domnich. Domnich joined the teaching staff of the Institut National de France, uh, Musique, a forerunner of the conservatoire, in 1794. Whilst wind and brass tuition was a key part of the original conservatoire's remit, most of the brass classes were soon disbanded, whittling it down around 16 brass teachers to just Domnich and the core alto, core mixed teacher, Frederick Duvenois. Domnich's 1808 Method de Première de Seconde Corps was expressly written for the conservatoire and can be seen in terms of the exercises as very much a forerunner of the 1824 Method pour coauto et corbas by Dobrin, Domnich's one-time adjunct and eventual successor at the conservatoire. Domnich and Dobrin both admit that the use of the hand in the bell changes the sound and that it is impossible to make these timbre differences disappear entirely. However, they both state that in the hands of a good player, it is possible to mitigate these timbre differences. Now, it is hard to overestimate the impact of Dopra and Domnich to a lesser degree on modern natural horn playing and the extent to which their guidance on diminishing timbre differences has impacted today's period performance. The pair both identify an approach to the challenge of timbre shifts incurred with hand technique, which they feel is insufficient. They state that traditionally it had been advised to support the stop notes with more air in order to make them more equal in volume and quality. Could it be that this traditional approach that both of them are pointing to is the performance practice of Punto? Domnich and Duvenois believed that this approach to be impractical in anything other than slow movements and instead advocate adopting a basic hand position in the bell which was quite covered and closed 
therefore making the open notes less bright. By adapting the open notes to a more closed and therefore less bright position, the darker stopped notes provide less contrast and a more blended effect can be created. Now, both of them referring to the fact that using the earlier approach in which the differences are greater um, as is impractical in anything other than slow movements, brings to mind a lot of what the vocal practitioners are saying about the cantable style, the slow style. Um, so this is Cori, um, a, a very, very influential um, uh, a person in, in terms of um, vocal technique. And Cori here is talking about the cantable style and what, um, what effects and what devices you use in the cantable style and picking up on portamento. And if we look at Garcia, um, he's also talking about the, uh, the uh, chant sample. And again, these are the things that start to jump out when you're looking at this style of playing, the style of singing, is the use of timbral effects and portamento. Whilst the earlier generation of Dominic and Duvenois barely mentioned portamento, Dopra quotes verbatim the conservatoire method de chant, thus very much endorsing Dominic's opinion that, quote, the school of an excellent singer is the best school of taste in music, and this is especially true for the horn, which has so much affinity with the voice. In line with the method de chant, Dopra identifies two types of what he calls portamento. The first is related to the slur, and the second, which he describes as a true portamenti, is an extended appoggiatura, i.e. playable on a rising or descending interval of a semitone or more. Dopra follows his discussion of portamento with the advice that passing from a stopped note to an open note is, of all slurs, the easiest to play and the best sounding on the horn. I think this is really important, that the suggestion that the combination of notes most liable to produce today what is a considered an unwanted glissando is the best sounding slur on the horn. And I believe this gives further credence to my suggestion that portamenti are an integral part of 19th century natural horn playing. Just to qualif uh, qualify a few things about portamento during this era, um, at the top, this is Laura Sinti Damaro's method de chant. Um, the first bar is what we would consider a slur when you go from two notes smoothly. Um, and we've got two sorts of ways of doing portamento. It depends which note you wish to carry. Um, so it's, it's much, much easier when you start to look at vocal, vocal technique and syllables or when you start to look at string playing and fingering and bow strokes. So at the bottom, you've got, um, this is Garcia and then De Berrio, and you can see, so you've got spaghi, spaghi. So you take the first note and then alter. So that's the second bar of Damaro there. Or you move on to the next note and then move. So actually, these are quotes from Dobra at the bottom. So if we had spaghi, that would be now spaghi. So those are two of the things that I've been experimenting with. In 1821, Dobra's student, Jacques-François Gallet, was awarded the Premier Prix. Upon graduation, Gallet quickly established himself in the Parisian musical scene. He initially joined the orchestra of the Odeon, but this position was soon superseded by his appointment in 1825 as corps solo of the Teatro Italien. Here's our guy, bottom left. Gallet's performances were celebrated. He was regularly heard performing as a soloist in concerts, including other leading lights of the Italian music scene in Paris, such as the singers Pasta, Malibran, Viado, Rubini, and Tamborini. When Rubini and Tamborini premiered Bellini's I Puritani in 1834 and Mercadante's I Brigante in 1836, it was Gallet who performed the respective horn obligatos. Gallet was frequently compared favorably to these particular singers, and on more than one occasion, singers were compared to him. The tenor Elivu was given the ultimate compliment in, in singing being appraised as akin to the sound of Gallet's horn. In the spring of 1842, La France Musicale reported of Pauline Garcia Viado delaying her departure to Spain due to a concert organized by the pianist Talberg, which was to include performances by Tamborini and Gallet. The unknown author of this report took the opportunity to berate the conservatoire for not having yet employed Gallet as professor and declared that the school, Horn School, still under the direction of Gallet's former teacher, Dopra, had been completely neglected. 
Six months later, a grand changement was announced with new professors, including Dupré, Garcia, Louise Frerenc, Hertz, and Gallet, replacing the old guard. Dopra was late, later to tartly refer to his former pupil, Gallet, as not his successor, but instead his supplanter. Given the numerous comparisons between Gallet and the leading singers of the period, especially those associated with Italian repertoire, as well as newfound employment alongside Dupré's and Garcia as part of the grand changement at the Conservatoire, it seems pertinent to look at vocal technique in order to glean more about the expressive effects such as timbre and portamento. Gallet was often praised for his ability to blend the contrasting timbres of the instrument, yet his approach was markedly different to that of his teacher Dopra and the earlier teaching of Duvenois and Domnich. Instead of tempering the sound of the open notes by the use of a more closed hand position in order to make the open notes more covered and therefore closer in timbre to the, that of the stop notes, Gallet advocated a more open hand position in order to not compromise the timbre of the open notes. Gallet's exploitation of the two timbres of the horn echoes Manuel Garcia's promotion of the two vocal timbres. Whilst on the horn we have the open and stopped timbres, Garcia promoted the timbre clair and the timbre sans. Gallet's horn playing was often directly compared to Rubini singing. Rubini, the son of a horn player, gave his debut performance at the Teatro Italiano in 1825, the same year that Gallet was appointed core solo to the establishment. Rubini was well known for his use of timbral and dynamic shading. Though the British press seemed more <laughs> critical of this than the French, Cox recounted that Rubini has also the habit of suddenly forcing out his voice, as it were, in gusts, and so suddenly withdrawing it as to be nearly inaudible. This was done on no fixed principle or in order to express any particular sentiment or epithet, but merely to produce a succession of contrasts thought by not a few who, from experience of the past, preferred a more level method of vocalization to be violent and unmeaning. In 1833, an anonymous writer in the Harmonicon reported that Signor Rubini refrained as much as with him as, as is possible from roulades in the aria of Mozart, and his alterations of fortissimo and pianissimo were more moderate. Indeed, he pretty nearly equalized his tones. The concept of a singer's equalizing or leveling tones or vocalizations seems in keeping with the issues we have as horn players. In one of his early chapters, on the equality of tones and on the intonation, Gallet, in his 1843 method, disagrees with Dopra and Dominich on the basic right-hand position. He does, though, reiterate their earlier entreaties to horn students. Finally, to obtain the most possible equality between the two types of notes, it is necessary to work on one or the other while striving every day to make the difference that would result from their continuous comparison disappear. However, this contrasts with the advice given in a much longer chapter on taste, style, nuances, expression, and the effect of the stop notes that closes the method, in which Galley describes the use of stop notes as one of the most important means of expression available to the instrument, describing it, this nuance, this contrast, this continual opposition as a way of endowing the music with an immense variety and adds an inexpressible charm to its beauty. For Gallet, the contrast between the stopped and open notes gave the instrument an indisputable advantage, a superiority of expressiveness that belongs to it alone. In his method, Gallet highlights four of his compositions in which he incorporates passages that exploit long passages of stop notes for expressive effect, i.e. actively using the timbral differences rather than, as Gallet advises earlier in his method, making the dis difference disappear. The works identified by Gallet include his Fantasia on Donizetti's Les Martes and Bellini's, Bellini's La Straniera. I have yet to be able to find a source for his um, Fantasia on La Straniera. If anybody knows it, please let me know. Um, as well as his ninth and eleventh solos for horn. I would additionally add the opening section of his third caprice as an example of Gallet's exploitation of the stop notes of the horn. Before I show you these examples, I just want to return to Garcia one more time to give you an idea of some of the things that are um, encouraging me to explore the timbral differences. Um, 
This is returning to Garcia's uh, method and the terms in which he's, ex he's asking the singers to be exploring their timbres. So we've got timbre clair, timbre simple. T the character metallique, you know, this, this is one of those words that sometimes comes out, you know, the metallic sound of the stop notes on the horn. So I was very interested to see a singer actually saying, make a metallic sound. So these are some of the terms that you find in Garcia when he's actually actively asking the singers to exploit these timbres. Um, this is the sort of thing we're looking at, Garcia. Um, if I just, you know, if you look at the bottom paragraph on the right-hand side, you know, the the la claire, la sombre, la claire, la ma, the 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 dull. All these terms are what the singers are being asked to express. Um, and this I want to share with you is some of the examples from later on in Garcia. This is a Rossini bass um, recit and aria from Semiramide. And we can see how annotated Garcia has been. You can see like um, timbre clair, éclat, timbre wand, timbre mat, concentré. Here he's going into a great detail about the timbres that the singers are exp expected to express. And yet when I was learning to play the natural horn, I was asked to make everything sound the same. <laughs> and the other reason I think this particular example is important is this is Semiramide. This is an opera that we have reports of Gallet performing in Paris. Um, also, Manuel Garcia, if you're not familiar with um, him and his teaching, he's the second generation of a very fam famous family of singers. Manuel Garcia, the first was his father. His sisters were Pauline Viedo and Maria Malibran, two of the most epic singers of their time. And Manuel Garcia, because partially he had such a long life, was very, very influential for a long time. And this gentleman here, this is the gentleman who debuted the aria we've just seen, uh, Filippo Galli. Um, he was a contemporary of uh, Manuel Garcia I. Both of them took opera companies to, for example, Mexico in the early 19th century to perform Semiramide. So I've got a lot of information about the singers who were singing this and proving the relevance of uh, Garcia's account, I believe. Just mindful of time, I'm going to show you a couple of slides and I'm going to demonstrate one thing and then I'm going to play you a piece of music which I think is quite important with what I'm looking at. Um, what I've shown here is um, in order to make the effects of the hand technique more comprehensible, the stop notes are marked black, um, the open notes are red and the small number of notes that could be done as either stopped or open. Now these are really crucially important, are uh, marked in blue. Um, I'm not going to go into too much details with these. Um, all I would say is I can show you examples of these pieces by Gallet where we can see, for example, um, you see the first two lines, this theme is all done with stop notes um, and then he opens up to a section all done with open notes. I am though just going to demonstrate one thing because it's just much easier to hear things. Wrong instrument. So what I want you to listen to, that second line, can you see there's two blue notes? If I choose to play those as stopped, not open, then I could create the whole of that second line as stopped, and then you'll see the effect when the music breaks into a whole stream of open notes.
Um, just got one. Oh, thanks. As I said earlier, um, it's very hard to describe Portamento. Um, here uh, we see um, Garcia doing diagrams. I find these diagrams incredibly um, uh, helpful when thinking about Portamento. And we've also got, if we start to look at the string methods of the time, here we've got um, De Berrio. You can see at the time, again, he's using a graphic way of showing us how to use um, portamento. I'm not going to discuss this, but if anybody wants to come and chat to me about this famous uh, Schubert song, da 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 da, ya, da 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 da, we've got great information from both the string players and the singers of the time. John Potter has done research into singers, early recordings of singers, and has a hundred recordings of this particular um, Schubert song. But I would just say that if we've got a hundred singers using portamento in this song, this begs questions when we're playing this Cherny Fantasia, which quotes this particular um, Schubert song. To finish with, I'm just going to play you a piece of music. Um, now, this is not a very well-known um, piece within our repertoire, um, but during the 19th century, this um, recitinaria was hugely popular. There's plenty of um, accounts of Galley being headhunted to play this with various singers. Um, and it's um, in the recitative that uh, precedes the aria, we've got, again, a very, very typical thing for horn playing in France of this era. We've got basically an obligato for horn and harp. Um, I've just depicted it here. The horn doesn't have a significant role in the aria that follows, but we have lots and lots of accounts where people have said um, Galley played this aria along with um, Maria Malibran, for example. And I just want to leave you with um, a recording from 1903. So this is just the aria that follows. Um, I know that there's people in this room who are very familiar with working with early recordings. Um, if you're not, um, I hope you enjoy a lot of these portamenti that you'll hear uh, Fabri in her recount. Now, if I do this. <laughs> 